You know, when I'm watching professional Dota, especially the recent Los Angeles tournament, I come to realize that the pros are generally better than all of us, and frankly, I hope we can all realize that. However, when I'm looking at the Twitch chat, I'm not so sure. In fact, I think a lot of Twitch chat doesn't actually realize what movements and, and strategies the pros implement to dominate their opponents. So yeah, in today's video, I'm going to be showing you guys 8 different techniques or strategies that the pros use by following a game between Na'Vi and NIP. It was the game that lasted a very, very, very long time, but there were some great strategies implemented by obviously the Captain PPD and his fellow players that you guys can learn and implement into your pubs as well to have a lot more success. On top of this video you're about to see, you know, about the pro scene, if you guys want to learn more professional strats or just things you could get better at to get towards the 6k or 7k level, I recently did some coaching sessions with a friend of mine who reached top 15 he was a mid player primarily, so we went over an Ember Spirit and a Storm Spirit gameplay that will be both uploaded there very, very soon. So if you are interested in those type of things, and really it's like it's some extremely complicated stuff within those analysis or things maybe a lot of people just would never think about in years of playing Dota. So if you're interested in that, definitely go check it out. It's in the link down in the description. If you click it, you just have to sign up very cheap, less than a Netflix subscription, and hopefully I'll see you there. Alright, so the first play I want to talk about is controlling the hill. So what do you do whenever you feel like you're in an advantageous position? And right now, NIP, they're not necessarily super far ahead, but they want to control the map and try to shut down the enemy. It's very clear why they would want to do this, right? The enemy team has a Medusa, they don't necessarily have a proper hard carry, and therefore they can go late game, right? They scale okay, but they would rather control the area and start to threaten high ground and control Roshan. And that's what they do here. They sort of are just going to run around this area and continue to basically basically farm around this area and control the hill. Now the purpose of this play is to fight in vision. Guys, I want to ask you a question. When you're going high ground, what don't you have? The answer is vision, and vision dictates fights. It dictates fights in the 2k MMR bracket, the 3k MMR bracket, and the 7k MMR bracket. It really doesn't matter. The team that has more vision generally wins. And that's what we're going to see here from NIP. Instead of running high ground, they want to wait for the next Roshan and they're going to control this hill. In fact, it is very important to note that they're controlling this hill and not the other side because they want Roshan control. Think about it. The other side of the map is not close to Roche, so it doesn't give you Roshan control. And yeah, now that they take a fight in very good vision, the enemy team has sort of a scuffed team fight. Pasha doesn't land too good of a Mars ultimate. The backline gets picked off by Tanner on the TA. The Razor gets echo slammed and the fight is over. And now why does that happen, right? Why does that happen in the first place? Look at this, guys. This is why you need to control hills for Roshan like the pros do and not run a high ground. Because if we look back at the start of the fight and, and in this area, you're going to notice that the, the backline, which is what the TA wants to jump, gets shown. And this ogre can be seen by the ward. So if we go in the TA's perspective, right, the TA is paying attention to the backline, right? She immediately shifts her focus. And because on the minimap she sees the ogre, it's a free jump pops the BKB and gets an immediate kill onto a stunner that would probably kite her later in the fight otherwise. And that's why you need to fight around wards and play around Roshan. Next up is one of the most common mistakes that players make, and I want to make sure you understand the way you basically prevent this. So what most players do in the end game or, you know, towards the late game is basically they'd farm the wave right here. And why is that dangerous? Well, once again, Dota is all about vision, it's all about staying together with your team in the late game, and making sure you take advantageous fights. So what happens here? Well, instead of trying to kill the wave, he is going to try to pull it to himself. So Medusa shoves it in and he brings it up towards the hill. This small micro adjustment is massive. It's legitimately massive because the difference of them jumping him on this hill compared to this hill is a world's difference. It literally changes the entire landscape of the fight and the vision that they'll be able to have. And if you don't believe me on this topic that this is very important, you should watch what the Hawk does throughout the entirety of the match. He doesn't do this once, he does it like 18 million times and I'm actually not over exaggerating. And yeah, just to give another example, literally on the next wave, no joke, next wave, he brings it over to the hill. And now if they jump him, his team can connect, right? Look at the minimap. His team can connect. It's a vision fight. That's exactly what you want. The next tip I have to mention isn't necessarily one I can show in one specific scenario of this game because it happens a million times, but it's their decision not to go high ground. Now, I want to ask you guys, why wouldn't they go high ground in this game? And I think if you are able to look at it pretty clearly, the simple answer is the enemy team has a Medusa, the enemy team has a Mars. If we go high ground, Medusa is going to stand in our face, auto attack us till we have to go away, or one of us will get speared deep into the base and it will create the worst possible fight, a fight on the enemy team's high ground. So instead, what do they do? 
Well, their solution in this game, <laughs> funny enough, ended up being dragging it to over an hour and a half, but <laughs> what you can do is once again control these hills and look for pickoffs. You can now see what the hog is drawing on the map right now, and I really think what he's trying to call out is that he wants his team to look for picks in this area so that they can start trying to go high ground as soon as possible. And I definitely agree with this mentality. I think them trying to go high ground would be straight suicide as the enemy Medusa has a divine rapier. The next point is also going to be a bit general and then we'll get back on topic with, you know, specific points that happen throughout this game. But before we get into that, I want to mention that it's very important that you build proper items. I recently made a video looking at secrets matches and how they itemize, but I'll quickly go down the list of this game and make sure you guys understand why the items they bought are pretty proper. Number one, we have a bristle who rushed hood. It's definitely good against the majority of the early game magical damage, which is typically what you worry about in early game of Dota. It's mostly magical damage. That's why you will see more pipes over crimsons in the majority of games, because even team comps that seem physical, such as a Medusa Razor, in the early game, primarily deal magical damage. But after that, of course, once people start to get their right-clicking items, which makes right-clicking a threat, he goes a blade mail, even has a plate mail now, a halberd, and a lotus orb. Moving on to the coddle, we're gonna see a ghost scepter and a force staff, also dealing with the right-click damage. The TA had a BKB, obviously, to deal with the physical damage, then opts for a Daedalus into a divine rapier, which I sort of like because we're going to be seeing evasion come out a little bit later on from the enemy team. And finally, because I'm not really going to cover the Earthshaker, I think his items are very similar to the Coddles and Bristlebacks, basically just with a bit more gold, it's a really good game to have a Lotus Orb for armor to reflect the stuns, reflect the length, deal with all these sort of things. And on top of that, he has a Force Staff and a Ghost Scepter to obviously deal once again with the right-click damage. That's how you kite out Medusa and raise her. And finally, we have the Underlord who goes Vlad's, once again, right-clicks, dealing with the right-click damage, and a Solar Crest buffing up obviously TA and the Bristleback, synergizing their physical damage and countering out the enemy team's physical damage. <laughs> okay, so now guys, skimming ahead uh, about like 40 minutes, we have a fight where Navi actually gets a pick off onto the cuddle and they wanted to siege high ground now. This doesn't end up winning them the game, but I really like the decision that Ilias makes on the Ogre match I right hear, and a lot of low moral players would never consider this. In fact, I've even been flamed by 3k and 4k players for doing this, and it just makes me want to hate them. <laughs> but basically all it is, is when your team is going high ground in the nighttime, it's very important that you put wards down, even if it is in vision of the tower or a sentry ward. You need vision to protect your cores and see the incoming initiation. And that's what we see from the Ogre here. Does he know? Guys, I'm asking you the question. Does he know that this ward is under the tower? Yes, most obviously, but once again, pro Dota and how they take fights is very much based around vision. So they need the vision to see what is coming. They need to see their flanks. They need to see the Earthshaker. They want to see the Underlord. They can even look for a jump, right? This is a big ward because if someone now steps up, which often in pubs they will, in fact, supports will even step up to D ward, this Observer Ward, you get a free pick off, and all of a sudden they'd have a chance to win the game. Now, NIP doesn't make the mistake of overstepping for it, but I really like this ward, even though it's getting scouted out. So the next point is what I like to call zoning the tower. One of the major mistakes in Pub Dota is diving towers. It just really doesn't work. If you guys look at your replays, you're gonna notice that every single time a team dives a tower, they basically guarantee to lose the fight. It's obviously not 100%, but if you look at the games, and I'm serious, look at your recent replay, and notice that the team losing the fight is almost the, always the team diving the tower because it ruins your coordination, it allows the enemy team to have full vision and choose their targets, and so instead what Blizzy does on the Underlord here is what I'm calling zoning the tower. So his TA is obviously taking it, and instead of necessarily diving the tower, he's simply going to threaten himself as the frontliner by using his Q and his W. And that's what we see here. He's just kind of threatening his presence, but he's not going to overextend. He's not crossing this very dangerous line that would allow him to get speared into the base. Instead, he's going a little bit far up, right? Zones them out and lets his team secure the tower without diving and over committing. Please guys, stop diving and over committing, including in solo queue pubs, because I often would hear the excuse, well, my team would dive anyway, or my team pushes towers when I tell them not to. I guarantee it, and I had to say this to a student recently and really drill it into his head, but basically what happened was, is they were pushing mid, and he told me that he instructed his team not to push, however, his character model continued to go forward. Guys, it's so hypocritical. Do not dive the towers, and if you don't want your team to push the next tower, don't run towards it. You have to run the other direction. Does that make any sense? Think about that. 
So next up, we're going to be following Tanner for a minute here, and what he's going to be doing is obviously farming his BKB. And no, I know you guys farm BKBs, you farm your items, that's, you know, a pretty basic thing for Dota. I think almost everyone understands that buying certain items makes them stronger. But the most important part here is what they do next. This is what almost no one does in pubs, unless it's like a 6k, 7k, or 8k average MMR game. And what we're going to notice is, is that Tanner is most likely telling his team within comms here that he's getting his BKB. And once again, I already hear the comments coming in, well, Speen. You know, my team will never listen to me, and that is why I'm stuck in the 3k MMR bracket. No, it's it's probably because you don't do a lot of things that I'm telling you in this video, but also, when you get your items like BKB, you want to tell your team to smoke. You need to say, hey guys, I'm about to hit a power spike. I'm about to get an item that makes my hero as strong as humanly possible, right? This is the major spike of TA. Blink, Deso, BKB. You don't get much better than this. And because of it, they immediately smoke off of it. Now, looking at the fight, unfortunately, it's not going to pay off. But that's the thing. Not everything is picture perfect. Dota is not a science. It's not some mathematical equation you can solve perfectly. However, if he managed to get the BKB off here, when the Mars went for the Arena Spear combo, it would have been a good fight. Unfortunately, he didn't. He gets chain stunned and died. But imagine if he BKB there. It probably would have been a really, really good fight. And so, yeah, just, just to recap that, Smoke when you hit item timings. In general, in solo queue, the more smokes you click, the better of a player you are. I guarantee that. And next up is for all you position 5 players. No, I'm not completely ignoring you. We did have the tip about Ogre Magi a little bit earlier, but this is a great tip just for every single position 5 player that is not using their sentry wards and basically playing the warding game properly. So what he does here, this is PBD, is he wants to deward this hill and check it. Number one, he does not place the observer ward first. When you are going for D-Wards, do not ward the hill first. Please D-Ward and then ward. It is going to make you less likely to get D-Warded in the future. And then, next thing is he does not place the sentry on the hill. There's two reasons for this. Number one, Cuddles Illuminate can get vision of the hill. Number two, he has the courier in the area, which he can simply send over the hill to get vision of it. And on top of that, it's much better if you place wars in areas like this, because they have a higher likelihood of scouting out wars you might not have found in the future, such as this sentry ward that is going to deal with traps and potentially cause issues for them in the future. And so yeah, just be very diligent about your warding. Never be the type of support to get lazy and just place sentries on hills all the time. However, I do want to give you one scenario where you actually would place a hill on the ward, especially a sentry, and that is within a fight. If a fight is breaking out and you want to take control of a hill. Now I'm going to theorycraft the situation here. So let's say the fight is taking place by the bottom hill on the radiant side and you know that the enemy team likely has a ward on that hill. Then I definitely want you to just place the sentry on the hill. Do not waste time. Do not have to burn your illuminate and put yourself at a position to deward it because you wanted to get the god sentry. In this case, your number one priority if, if a fight is taking place close to a hill is to put down an obs, put down a sentry, Get the D-Wards and reposition. That is a very important distinction to make as a position 5 player, so you can take fights as soon as possible and give your team the vision they need to pick off the key targets. But thank you guys for watching this video on 8 things that pros do that you do not. If you enjoyed it and want to help me, you know, outsmart the YouTube algorithm, please click the like button and comment something down below. Just maybe something that you learned within this video or a tip that you noticed within this NIP versus Navi series that could be useful to everyone in the community. But yeah, if you enjoyed and want to see more content like this in the future, like I just said before, like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. And hey guys, remember, before you end this video, in the link down below, I've been playing a lot of live games where I talk about my thoughts in real time in the middle of a Dota match. So if you want to get in the head of a pro player, click the link down below to the Game Leap website. Super cheap right now. Right, like, and I'm doing this a ton. We all have time on our hands. I have time to make content. You guys probably have time to enjoy and learn Dota, get better at the game. So yeah, if, if that combo works for you, click the link down below and I'll see you there.